Today, we are thrilled to present Expo Video, Ghost in the Screen, featuring our 2016 Expo Video curator and curator at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Daria de Bouvet, and Expo Chicago's director of programming and editor-in-chief of the scene, Stephanie Cristello. Please join us in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, Emily. Um, as Emily said, I'm the director of programming for Expo Chicago, um, and we're thrilled to be welcoming Daria de Beauvais this year from the Palais de Tokyo. Um, we met, must have been nine months ago. I think we invited Daria to be the guest curator for the video program. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, the video program is on the west end of the pier um, and is really, I think, a special program um, with a lot of artists, um, museum quality pieces presented in two screening programs. Um, so what we'll be talking about today later on in the conversation are some of the works that are uh, on view as part of that program. Um, but we also wanna introduce you all to Daria, her curatorial work, um, exhibitions that she's worked on, and some of the thematics that are shared between the Expo video program and uh, exhibitions that she's worked on uh, in the past recent years. So Daria, I'll, um, with that sort of introduction, um, let you speak a little bit about recent exhibitions that you've done, um, give sort of an overview of your practice as a curator, the thematics that move you, um, and some of the artists that you've worked with in the past. Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm really glad to be here with you today and to have the chance to curate the Expo video programs this year. So we'll talk a bit later about these two programs specifically, and indeed now maybe we'll get into talking about previous shows I've organized, um, mostly in Paris, but not only, that I will tell you a little bit about, so you can follow the red thread from this to what's on view now as a fair. So behind us is an exhibition view of a show called Into the Woods that I created for an art space called La Galerie des Galeries in Paris. And Into the Woods was a group show with like 11 artists, women artists only. Um, and the idea was to imagine a walk through the woods uh, and contours with strange works. Uh, and also it was a way of seeing the artists maybe as witches um, with creating these very powerful artworks. What you have here on the screen is first a sculpture by French artist Laetitia Bado Haussmann. It was really like shiny, beautiful, and mysterious because you don't really know what you're looking at. Like, is it organic? Is it mineral? Is it even alive? Nobody knows, and maybe not the artist herself. On the background is an installation by Alicia Quade. Actually, she's having a solo show on Koenig's booth uh, from Berlin right now at the fair, so if you have the time, you should stop by to see her uh, uh, more recent works. And in these works, she worked with very solid materials like metal, glass, um, wood, and these elements are bended. So it looks a bit like telekinesis in a way, like she's been bending the, the, the material just with a, a wheel. So there was a kind of magic in this. I like the way that you talk about that too. I mean, we invited Alicia for a panel in Chicago as part of Dialogues in February, and I never thought about um, sort of the telekinesis that you just mentioned of her work as if she was bending it herself. Um, but I, I'm always fascinated by that sort of magic and illusion that she uses for materials, um, taking very hard materials and sort of transplanting them into a little bit more of unexpected contexts, which I think is what um, you were sort of doing in this exhibition as well. Um, you also had more uh, traditional um, mediums in that show, so you can see in the middle some ceramic sculptures by young French artist Mimosa Echard. It's a collection of Batmans, uh, but like very bent, uh, melted, so it would be a kind of like very worn out Batman <laughs> who lost I its magic and strength. Uh, it was in dialogue with uh, a series of paintings by Adnor Sacrist, French artist as well. It's, um, it's a black series, so it's almost 
abstract uh, landscapes. Actually, originally it's a waterfall in uh, the Bois de Boulogne, a forest near Paris, and now it becomes almost like an inner image, an image of the mind. And so both uh, series are very recognizable uh, themes, but in their abstractness, open like more ways of seeing them. This is uh, Paravent, a screen by Anne-Laure Sacrist again, um, that was uh, very bright and colorful on, the, on this side, and the other side was also part of the Black series. So it was a, a kind of like day and night vision of the same landscape. On the left, you see Leticia Badosman's work that we've talked before, and on the background is this beautiful painting by Iris van Dongen. She's a Dutch artist, and this is mostly like the main figure of the show, which was a kind of witch in the forest, which you don't know if she's leading you on the way out or leading you inside the forest itself. One last image by Jessica Warboys, English artist, uh, which was a video. So um, I'm not showing videos only as you've been thinking, but video has been also one of the threads of my curatorial practice. That was I was so happy to be part of Expo Video. So Jessica's uh, video shows a kind of ritual. The artist herself appears like a master of this ritual. You have these very mysterious objects and you had a very repetitive uh, music. It's a loop and you don't really understand what's happening, but you think, you understand that like, it's something extremely powerful. Great. This is another exhibition that I'd like to talk about because it was a kind of one of a kind project at the Palais de Tokyo. Palais de Tokyo is an art center in Paris. We don't have a collection, everything is temporary. And we work mostly with uh, young artists. Uh, we are the biggest art center in Europe in terms of size. We are 22,000 square meters. But in 2013, I did this solo show with Julio Le Parc, uh, Argentinian artist, now living in Paris, and he's uh, uh, today 84 years old. So it, it was a very historical artist. It was part of the cinetic art and op art movements in the 50s. Uh, 60s, 50s, and 70s, and um, he's, um, he had lots of exhibitions in the US, in Latin America, and maybe dropped a bit on the side in France, so this was his ground like comeback, and we all realized how fresh and contemporary his language was still, and he's working mostly with uh, light, as you can see here, so you had this big circle, and you had just rays of light moving around, like, I guess, on uh, YouTube, you will find images of it like activated, and it's really mesmerizing and hypnotic. So this is me, <laughs> seeing <laughs> one of his work. <laughs> so again, working with light, but always in a very uh, simple manner. There is no like big technology. You just had like this mirror wall, a curved white wall, and this little metallic element moving just out of air of people walking around. And so it was like being inside water with this ever-changing um, light landscape. Series of paintings. So to show another part of his work, and again, as you can see, it's always about playing with light. One last work, so you understand that it's not only about working with black and white. He's done uh, many um, hanging works, many, many mobiles, and this one is just plastic red uh, elements, and again, with the light changing, because it was lit in natural light, and with the move uh, of the sun in the room, you had the, the work was very different uh, each time of the day. And I wanted to bring up as well, just sort of this idea of time and movement and the cinematic quality of some of the works that you've done that are not videos as well. Um, that was sort of one of the reasons why I was interested in inviting you for the video program, because you seem to have a curatorial focus that's not strictly towards moving image work necessarily, but work that has this sort of cinematic quality um, with Alicia Cavade's work, with Julio's work. Um, 
can you speak a little bit more about your relationship to materials um, and how how they how these exhibitions specifically might relate to your interest in film? Um, yeah, I think the work cinema the word cinematic is extremely important to me because I feel like um, artists, by creating their works, um, are storytellers. And curating an exhibition is also about storytelling, about like moving to maybe a parallel universe. And I think artworks are great mirrors of our society, but also bring us like somewhere else, somewhere more mysterious. And, uh, and this kind of m mystery, uncanny feeling, uh, also is necessary for me to like to balance what society is today. Great. This is another solo exhibition uh, I did with Dutch artist Anne Wenzel. Uh, it was an art space called Tent in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So Anne is working um, mostly with ceramics. And as I was saying about Mimosa and Charles earlier, uh, I was quite interested in using this medium because, well, it's coming back now, but for many, many years, ceramics was like totally out of the game uh, for contemporary art. And I think like artists have many things to say, whatever the medium is. So it doesn't have to be digital um, to tell us a lot about contemporary society. So this show was called The Opaque Palace, and it was mostly a walk, a walk inside maybe, and the, the, the fiction behind this exhibition was about walking around an, an abandoned palace. So here you could see this uh, deer uh, melting into material, um, and you don't know if it's been hurt or if it's just, you know, powerfully expressing itself in the middle of the forest. And the artist did this wall painting around, like a, a faded uh, wallpaper from an uh, ancient palace. So this is, how do you say lute? A chandelier. A chandelier. Mm. That's uh, mm. for... Uh, yeah. yeah, but chandelier in French is about, um, it's like it's a faux ami. It doesn't mean exactly the same thing. So this fallen chandelier was actually really huge, like human size. You would arrive like half of it. And it felt like a very brutal work, like suddenly just fell from the ceiling. And uh, would be uh, at the same time uh, quite beautiful, but a bit uh, threatening as well, because it could like fall into you. Uh, in this series of torsos, uh, the artist uh, worked after portraits of powerful men, like politicians, uh, military men. She took their portraits like from ancient war books or about just like today's newspaper. But again, these powerful man, uh, men are a bit like lacking their power. They are melting, they were totally disfigured. She worked a lot also uh, after these images from World War I. Uh, we say girl cassé in French, which means like all these men were really totally disfigured by uh, by the war, and it uh, became a strong influence for her to like to talk about um, power and losing its power. And one last image for this show, it was at the end of the exhibition itself. So she can of created a, a pond uh, made out of black ink. From it was emerging like a, like a burnt landscape surrounded again by a wall painting made out of ink. Uh, the, wall, the wall painting was about a very abstract forest and this, it was his idea, again, the forest. You see it's something that's quite obsessing me. So you would be in the middle of this burnt forest just before going back to reality. Maybe I'll show a few images of this exhibition and then you can say a few words about Angelica's work. Uh, now we're back at Palais de Tokyo in Paris and that was a show with uh, Angelica Makul. She's a Polish artist based in Paris and she's uh, originally a video artist. The first image, image you've seen, she went to Chernobyl um, to shoot there. She's always going to the like most dangerous place. Uh, she went to Fukushima after the tsunami. She did a, a film in Iraq. So she went to Chernobyl. So she's always trying like to push uh, her boundaries. 
and go like where every, everyone else is not really willing to go. Um, so her work is video, but also installation and sculpture. And the, w the show was called Terre de Départ, which means like departure land. And it was after um, a kind of uh, cultural reference to a right from the Chilean uh, Indians, uh, uh, stating that Earth is this uh, departure land. Uh, it's just like a departure point uh, as human beings to go then to the, to the stars and the sky. And, um, and this was the end of the show, actually. So you were surrounded by this kind of like plastic, weird material, and you would feel a bit trapped, but then you would go back to light going out of the exhibition. And was this sort of the first exhibition that you had where this, the idea of the spiritual or that sort of undertone started making its way into your focuses? I think spirituality has always been one of the threads that interest me. This is a show by 2014 that I co-created with uh, Jean Deloisy, Palais de Tokyo's president, and Catel Jaffres, uh, another Palais de Tokyo's curator. And, well, as the title says, it was about interiority, and the exhibition would took most of Palais de Tokyo's spaces, so it was quite huge. We invited uh, about 30 artists. Um, you would start with very, like, big, immersive, site-specific works, and more, the more you would go into the show, the more the works would, would get smaller, and it would be about, like, inside an architecture, and then inside a body, and then inside uh, a mind, and at the end, inside one soul. So this is Mark Menders, um, a Dutch artist. This is um, a tunnel made out of tape uh, by the designer group uh, Newman. And so you could crawl inside it, actually. So it's only made out of tape, so which is kind of crazy. But uh, we built a staircase so people could go into it and would crawl and go down at the end before really entering the exhibition. And it was a really uh, immersive um, artwork. Uh, some found it a bit frightening, but it was mostly like very meditative. When you would be uh, alone in it, it would feel like meditation and really, really, really quiet. Uh, you see first a sculpture by R English artist Ryan Gunder. Um, it's a marble sculpture, so very classical, beautiful uh, sculpture, but it's after uh, his daughter's creating dance inside the home. Like every kid would use like a fabric and a couple of wood things or a chair and create their own, their own tent. And so this is like a, a child's game, but made in a very classical uh, work. And on the background, you see a drawing by Ataru Sato, uh, a great, great Japanese artist who did this work, but mostly draw uh, on site. And he stayed the whole duration of the show drawing every day uh, in public. That was quite fascinating. This is Andro Vekua. He's originally from uh, Georgia. Uh, in Eastern Europe, and so this was the best metaphor for the exhibition. So you have this uh, human body uh, whose head is inside this house, and so this house is a metaphor of one's life, one's home, a home being a kind of protective uh, surrounding. We're now uh, in 2015, and Céleste boursier mougeno a French artist, uh, has this crazy idea to flood Palais de Tokyo. And actually, we did it. So what you see is a river inside the art center, and you would visit the exhibition by using a boat. So you can't imagine how complex it was in terms of techniques and logistics, but that's a good point with artists' crazy ideas you can find a way to make them happen. So you would be around with this boat and you had cameras um, all around the place like sh shooting at you and your image would be then uh, screened somewhere else as a kind of ghost image as you can see on the right. But you would never know when or where your reflection would appear. And so 
lots of Greek mythology uh, was happening in this show. We'll talk about Greek mythology later. Yes. <laughs> for Daedalus. And so it was at the same time as the myths of Narcissus. This character would drown in the water for admiring his own reflection because you could reflect yourself either on the water or on the walls. So you had to be to watch out not to lose yourself in your own reflection. And it was also this black river was like um, Charon, who is the, the person who takes the souls in his boat to go uh, to Inferno. Yeah, and the river, the whole mythology of the river Styx as exactly, well. Exactly, exactly. So, and here you, you see again someone on the water. So yeah, Greek uh, mythology and the Greek one especially is something that's important. And we'll certainly to get to that when we talk about yeah. the second screening room. Uh, this is a very recent exhibition that uh, just closed two weeks ago uh, that I did with Mika Rotenberg. Mika is an um, Argentinian artist, but she's been based in the US for more than 10 years now. She's doing video installations, and she has a very, very peculiar universe. She works, she's a lot influenced by the, by the theme of work. So both working spaces as like uh, chain working or also office working. And she creates these really absurd uh, films where she's always mixing reality and fiction and you really never know which when is where. Uh, so here you had this work called Seven uh, where basically you had this man pedaling to activate a sonar where another person was, um, and out of the sonar, you would take the sweat out of the person as a product to create many, many other things. So each effect would bring you to another like creation, and it, again, it was a, kind of a loop. This was a mouse, uh, like real size mouse, protruding out of the wall, and you had to go really near it to see a video that was inside it. It's so almost like Etan Donné. Sorry? It's almost like Etan Donné, the idea exactly, of looking exactly. through a hole. And what did you end up seeing inside? Uh, in this video, it was a very psychedelic um, work uh, wh where you would see like body parts, uh, mouses, hair, butts, um, uh, like protruding out of holes in, uh, in the wall and uh, in a very like quick uh, edit of the video and it would be like what's hidden happening behind this wall. One last uh, example of previous exhibitions. This is Shanna Moulton. She's an uh, American uh, artist based in California. She does video installations and we commissioned her with a site-specific uh, work uh, that you can see here in the location of Palais de which is a public space. So that's a place where lots of people like meet and she created this um, architecture influenced both by antique uh, Egypt, as you can see with the uh, sculptures on the side. The floor was inspired by a uh, Cole's uh, cathedral floor. And you had this kind of a pyramid, which was also like a temple you would have to enter to see the second room. So you have a, cl a close up. So that's inside the temple. Uh, you had uh, this mannequin, and on it, the mannequin's butt, you had a projection, which we don't really see here, but you see a white space. And on, as, and on the other side, you would have a video shot on, on site, just when we finished installing the show, so that was a kind of mise en abîme, and you would yourself become like an actor of this movie. And so I think that that provides a really good sort of stage for exhibitions that you've worked on, thematics that you've worked on. Um, so I did want to start um, with a few questions specifically about this year's program, um, which you've approached in a new way for what we've done. Um, this is the first year that we're presenting the screening rooms in two parts. Um, and Daria, you chose to curate these um, video sections in really two narratives. Um, so that viewers are able to be immersed within one screening room, one thematic, um, as well as another in two parts. So I wanted to ask you, um, what were some of your reasons for the split? Too many good works. <laughs> yeah. So basically, as you might know, the idea with Expo Video is to show works by artists 
uh, whose galleries are participating in the fair. So I invested, uh, investigated in the um, galleries artist list, uh, discovered many artists I was not so familiar with, and uh, looked at many, many videos and discovered that lots of them were actually really good. And, um, and I ended ended with lots of videos, so I had to make some choices. <laughs> and for me as well, I mean, it, it reads more theatrical, which your exhibitions do as a sort of act one and act two. Um, how's your feeling about the sort of cinematic structure of the film exhibition itself? I think both programs um, show very strong works, well, in, in two very different themes, but we'll get back to that later. And yeah, you could consider it's act one and act two, uh, because in the end, even if it's a difference, they, they share a few like red threads. Uh, for instance, the idea of the, of the uncanny, right. um, the idea of being like immersed in an uh, artist's minds and, uh, and obsessions. And so let's start with screening room one and, and sort of dig into that a little bit more. You've titled it this year, The Yellow Wallpaper, which shares its title with a short story by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, um, published in 1892. Um, and you describe it as an important early work of feminist literature that depicts a young woman's descent into psychosis, um, not unlike some of the exhibitions that you've worked on. For me, some of the pieces that fit the most within that were Aida Ruilova's Goner, which is sort of this um, trope of slasher films uh, led side by side, but with no real idea of, of why the narrative is happening and, and what the horror is. Um, but there's certainly this effect um, which carries over into Camille Henro's Dying Living Woman, which we have up here. Uh, where the artist sort of scratched away at the film reels to make a ghost out of the female protagonist in Night of the Living Dead. So for me, one of the questions was, um, how did you approach horror with the yellow wallpaper? Um, so as you've been saying, the yellow wallpaper is a, is a text, and uh, I must say that literature has always been a very strong influence uh, on me. Um, I didn't like quote books for any exhibitions, but this is something like ongoing. For instance, for Mika Rottenberg, uh, Alice Advent Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was a strong like influence. So this time, this this text that I read like many years ago, um, I never used it before, but it just stayed in my head. And when I was looking at some of the videos uh, for the program, it just came back to me as a really good like metaphor of wi women's struggle in uh, today's society. So as you must have noticed, this program is only made uh, of videos by women artists. It was not like a specific choice, and um, but it just happened. So it seems that I mostly work with women artists, even if it's, if it's not a, uh, like a volunteer choice. It's just that these, these works happen to, to be really good. and. Ida Willowas Gona is yeah maybe the f most frightening work in uh, in the selection. It's kind of yeah even myself when I look at it you know I would jump <laughs> in for s a few scenes. And this video is inspired by the Italian giallo. So the giallo was a kind of movie that uh, was made between the 60s and the 80s in Italy, and its master would be uh, Dario Argento. And these films were a mix of like horrific movies, uh, but also um, like the fantastic, like supernatural elements would be part of it. Uh, eroticism also uh, would be a very strong um, link. And in terms of imagery and colors, it would be kind of baroque, very, very rich imagery. And so this kind of movies, I think, was also an influence for the for the work because you see this woman uh, trapped in a room and basically being attacked by the room itself. And at one point you're wondering like if it's really happening or if it's just all in her head. So it's kind of a metaphor of someone's fighting with its own demons. And for as horrifying as it is or as gory as it is, I found myself sort of laughing at the, at the ridiculousness of how far it goes. Um, you know, with it, 
just the blood splattering and it, it's sort of unrelenting for 10 minutes of this horror that you can't quite place. Um, and even in this, in this film shot of um, Camille and Rose sort of scratching away, the, the cartoonishness of the ghost for me is a type of black comedy. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about sort of the humorous aspect in some of these works despite sure. their horror. I just would like to say that right now Camille Ho is screening uh, one of her last films at the MCA. So uh, it's called Grosse Fatigue and it won the Silver Lion in the Venice Biennial um, in 2015. So I strongly recommend you to go and see it because it's really uh, a masterpiece to this date. Very strong film. But back to this our one. discussion. And so this is called Living Dying Woman. And Camille used the footage of uh, The Night of the Living Dead uh, by George Romero. So one of the first like zombie movies ever. And this film is all black and white and very frightening. But by scratching this character, she, ma she makes it almost like you would say, almost a cartoon. So this woman is basically trying to escape. But as it is a loop, it, it, there is this kind of cartoonish thing of a character, you know, always trying to escape something, but never managing it. So it's both like funny and frightening because there is no resolution to this. This is Suzanne McWilliams' Faint, so it's an older work. It was important for me to spread in, in time, so the work for, for this election go from uh, 1996 to 2016, um, so it's a quite broad range. And this is a very short film, so you have this woman character under a tree that just faints. And so you have first the image of this beautiful garden, and you hear the birds humming, and then you have a close-up on her, and she just falls. So there is a kind of slapstick yeah. element out of it, but uh, also almost, I would say again, a bit Baroque in its right. imagery. Um, no, this one is um, um, by Desiree Dolron, and this one is not really funny. It's more a kind of wandering uh, in a, a Texas swamp. So it's, uh, it's real footage. And actually, this l landscape is totally fascinating because, um, you know, it really looks like someone's dream or nightmare because I guess she's on a boat and it just never ends. So there is no way in, no way out. It's quite uh, labyrinthic in a way. And the movement, you know, one of the things that I was thinking of when you were speaking about Celeste boursier mougenot's exhibition is that the movement in this film being from the perspective of the boat is not unlike that sort of uh, journey along the river sticks that you're experiencing at the Palais de Tokyo. Um, and I believe in your curatorial statement, you said that this work is stunning but deadly, that there's this sort of undertone um, of an encroaching species or an encroaching um, effect that is threatening to the viewer. Yeah, it's true because you, well, th this video is quite short, but you, you lose your marks when, you, when you're looking at it. And it's like when I looked at it for the first time, I played repeats several times and, you know, you really get into it. And of course you want to escape, but maybe not so much. It's mesmerizing. So I, I wanted to say a few words about this piece, um, which really became the the center and focal point of Daedalus, um, the second uh, exhibition screening program um, in, in number two. And we were sort of talking about humor a little bit um, as, as an undertone of the, some of the works in screening room one, um, like the slapstick or the sort of over the top horror. But for Mary Reed Kelly, um, which this piece is a, a still from, Humor is also really a central portion of her work through dialogue. Um, and I wanted you to talk a little bit more about this piece uh, with her having also just won yesterday the MacArthur Genius Grant. Yes, that's very important. I was yeah. uh, really excited when I learned this. So Mary Red Kelly um, works also a lot with uh, Patrick um, Kelly. They, they work together. And they create these uh, very like specific videos. 
and text is very important. Every video is extremely well written. So both the imagery and the text are fascinating. And it's really this kind of video you really have to pay attention uh, about what is said because it's both extremely like um, uh, very well referenced. So you can see all the cultural references uh, behind the text, but it's also incredibly funny, kind of, um, you know, we say, we call that um, uh, humor à froid, which is kind of deadpan humor, I yeah. would say. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not obviously funny, but then when you play attention, you pay attention, it's like really, really humorous. And this video is from a trilogy um, that the artist has made, uh, made about the Minotaur figure. Uh, so a lot of her works are inspired by Greek mythology. Um, and so this was really one of the first work that I selected and uh, made me think about this Daedalus uh, theme. And, um, and so tell us a little bit more about that, about Daedalus itself, the sort of the myth of it and how you're using it for sure. your curatorial. So Daedalus, as you might know, is a figure from Greek uh, mythology and you have traces of him a lot in um, Homer's text. So Daedalus is a creator of the labyrinth. Uh, he created it for King Minos in, um, in, uh, in Greece. And this labyrinth was created to keep the Minotaur prisoner. The Minotaur being this uh, character, um, half human um, and half animal, which is a male figure, except in this video, the artist turned it into a female figure, which is kind of interesting. And of course, the you have this very well-known episode of Cezaeus, who came to kill the Minotaur and was helped by Minos' daughter, Ariadne, to to go into the labyrinth, not get lost, kill the Minotaur, and come back. And of course, like in most of Greek myths, it all ends really badly, because he promised his love to Ariadne, so that's why she helped him. But in the end, he just abandoned her and went away for new adventures. And the sort of navigating of the labyrinth, I think, is a really important um, aspect to the second screening program. and. In your curatorial statement, you also mentioned this beautiful line by artist uh, Michelle Albarola that says, the exit is inside. And I wanted you to sort of elaborate on, on the idea of the exit. Um, yeah, this is um, a sentence. Um, Jean-Michel Albarola is, uh, is a painter, and he also does wall paintings. And actually, in the inside exhibition, you, you, you've seen a few images. Uh, the last work was Jean-Michel's uh, Jean uh, wall painting which says la sortie est à l'intérieur, which means the exit is inside. And I find this sentence extremely inspi inspiring because it says, well, many things. It says that the solution is inside yourself. It says that the way out, out of like everyday issues or personal problems, you can find uh, in yourself. It also says that the labyrinth or the complications of problems you might have come from yourself. So it's this idea of like everything comes from you. Uh, you can seek help from other people or, or other things, but really it's, it's up to you to find the solution. Or a sort of self-created architecture that also doubles as a trap. Exactly. Yeah. And also I really like this uh, um, image of the labyrinth because it's one of the more uh, shared uh, images and symbols in every culture and every period of history. So it's a very rich, uh, very rich symbol. Yeah, and I wanted to speak also about um, a word that you've brought up a few times, but I wanted to focus on the idea of the uncanny um, or the subconscious and how it filters into some of the works that you're interested in. You're also including Pierre Bismuth following the right hand of Lucian Freud within this program. Um, can you speak a little bit more about your relationship uh, to, the, to that? Sure. And uh, indeed, uh, you were mentioning a video by uh, Pierre Bismuth. Uh, he's, a, he's a French artist. And he's done this series called Following the Right Hand Half. And it's both a series of videos and drawings. And it's really fascinating because you have this fun footage from the 1930s of uh, Freud talking to an anonymous person. Which is rare. I mean, to have footage of Freud yeah, also. Yeah, it's, it's like extremely rare. So it's history. 
And of course, as he's talking, you know, he's moving his hand around like we all do. And the artist has been drawing following his hand. And so it creates a kind of pattern, a very labyrinthic pattern, mm -hmm. actually. And that was a good uh, starting point also, uh, like Mary Red Kelly, for this uh, selection. Because, well, the Incani, I won't talk about it in Freud's way because, well, he does we it better know. than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but still, it's the idea uh, that uh, the everyday life uh, bring always brings these un uncanny moments, uh, uncanny visions. And, um, and that was what I was saying previously about artists, that they are a mirror of society, but uh, maybe deforming mirror. And uh, which is welcome because it shows us um, what we are, uh, not as obviously as a mirror, but that's what more interesting. And I wanted to talk also about the idea of ritual and how you approach that, not only in the work that you select or are interested in, but as a curator yourself. What are some of, some of the ways that ritual works its way into your practice? It's true that ritual is something that um, appear uh, regularly in um, in artist works I'm working with, and I, so I think this ritual is also like working in an exhibition because when you visit an exhibition, uh, ideally when you leave it, uh, it stays inside you, and it's uh, it's a kind of ritual and it gives you thing to think about. Uh, I experienced it yesterday at the MCA, uh, working in the Kerry James Marshall uh, exhibition, and I was not so familiar with the work, right. but I, I left the show and it's, I mean, it's still strongly inside me, and uh, I know it will give me like material to process uh, through, through time, to, through times coming. So also this idea of ritual is um, about artworks, that bring us a bit further away from our like daily concerns. So this is the idea of the artwork um, showing us another path. Right. So it's not about following the yellow brick road, it's following the other path, the darker one. <laughs> I like that. Um, and I have a few more works from Daedalus that I just want you to say a few words of. Sort uh, of yeah, inclusion. maybe talking about uh, Jasper Just. So Jasper Just is a video artist um, from Northern Europe. He's uh, based in the US now. So I didn't choose one of, the, of his latest videos uh, because I think, um, well, this one is really strong. So it's called It Will All End in Tears. It's from 2006. And um, it's a quite narrative, but the in three parts. And the three parts are so different that, again, it takes you time to process all this. So you first are in a, like in a Chinese garden with two men, a young man and an older one, and you don't know like if it's a mirror of the same person at different ages, right. or if they're like friends or lovers, or it's just maybe one is dreaming of the other, and you will never know actually, so it's really up to you. Uh, then you are in a kind of a, a closed courtroom, and it all ends in a roof of, of a uh, Brooklyn, New York building with fireworks, a kind of like explosion. <laughs> And and really, it, it makes no sense. That's what's so and good about it. And very ornamental as well. I loved when you sort of spoke about that earlier, the idea of the Baroque, um, or that some of the works in this program are adhering to the aesthetics of ornament, but not necessarily with a clear narrative or um, a, a structure that's fully understandable. It's more abstract. It's true because I think uh, art, um, well, it's about like knowledge, it's about learning things, but it's also a lot for me, um, a thing about perception. Uh, that's why I like sometimes to work with artists to create immersive artworks. So you're really like inside the work itself, uh, you become part of it, and it's um, a way of maybe forget about knowledge sometimes and just experience the work. Um, as a sensation. There's one more work here. If you want to say a few words sure, and then we'll sure. open up that's to questions. A more, that's a more political work because, of course, as I was saying several times, uh, artists uh, talk about society. And so this is uh, Piedras Blancas by uh, Miguel Angel Rios. Um, he's a Mexican artist, and for this work, he shot it in uh, Argentina, I think. So he made like hundreds of white cement rolls, bowls, and he, 
you put them all at the same location and let them just run down um, the landscape. So it's a very short video and quite like violent in a way because there are lots of them and they go very quickly. So really, basically, you don't want to be in the middle of it. And for him, it was a kind of metaphor of like migrations issues uh, that are especially uh, happening nowadays, mm -hmm. and also about like the, the, the drug passage between uh, Mexico and, and the US. Yeah. And so all these fluxes of goods or peoples, uh, like uh, official or not, legal or not, uh, that's really like a mirror of uh, today's world. And sort of crossing those boundaries. Exactly. It's all about crossing boundaries. And maybe just one thing I would like to add, uh, it's more about curatorial practices in general, because um, the etymology of to create is to take care of. And I really like that because for me, working with artists is taking care of them, accompany them, and help them like to, to create their work. Um, so for me, being a curator is being a facilitator in a way. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I think that that's a pretty good overview of the program. Um, we're open to questions if anybody has some in the audience. Thank you. Um, is it on? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about what it's like working in that uh, uh, Palais de Tokyo space because it's just cavernous and never ending and labyrinthine in itself. I'm wondering if that has changed your your practice at all and how, how you relate to that as opposed to other spaces, working spaces. Uh, yeah, it's a good question because Palais de Tokyo is an absolute anti-white cube. Uh, it's a very uh, peculiar place uh, with lots of layers of history and um, I think it's a great playground, both for artists and curators, because it forces you to go a bit further. Um, the space is so big and high and, and weird in a way, and difficult, that it forces you to, well, to work harder, to make something look like something. <laughs> Anyone else? If we have no other questions, sorry, did you have one? No. If we have no other questions, um, thank you all for coming, and I hope that you're able to spend some time with Daria's program here at the fair. Um, we're thrilled to have it, and um, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.